I tell people I, I bleed purple. As a player, you can't find a better city to play in than here. It's because of the fans. I just remember that dome just rocking. Just felt like being shot out of a gun when they called us. You could just feel the place moving. Go football! It's never been like that anywhere else. This is football, this is pure football. You know, this is the old style football. It hurts a little, huh? We were better than everybody thought we were. I don't believe it! And we, we were better than what Bud told us we were. Jim Marshall, Carl Eller, Alan Page, Fran Tarkenton, Chuck Foreman. These are tough, honest players. Just to be part of that legacy makes it special. I think we did a pretty solid job of perpetuating that tradition. Just really get to play with some great guys and become lifelong friends. We play so hard for each other because we all liked each other. You're going on the field with your family, basically. That's the most memorable part of being on the Stone Purple. Look around, fellas. This is it, huh? That's all we got. We got each other. It has been a wonderful, wonderful 50 years. I thank the Lord all the time for giving me the opportunity to be here in Minnesota. <laughs> Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. All right, let's do this, everybody. How are you? It's your pal, Tim Hanlon. It's Good Seats Still Available. Of course, it's the curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Thank you for finding us and uh, finding us today uh, in the great state of Minnesota, in particular the Twin Cities, and more specifically, one of those Twin Cities, the city of Minneapolis. Uh, Sadly, we were not going to be talking about the Minnesota Vikings, uh, the clip that kind of sets the tone uh, for our venture up north. Uh, And hard to believe, by the way, that the Vikings will be now entering their 63rd season in the National Football League. 1961 is when they started. Uh, in earnest. But as our guest this week, R.C. Christensen is here to tell us, uh, Minneapolis, Minneapolis's hard to say, uh, pro football life began way earlier than that. Matter of fact, almost to the original roots or the original years of the founding of the National Football League. Now, uh, people will remember 1920 is the sort of official uh, historical marker of the beginning of the National Football League was known, of course, um, back then as the uh, American Professional Football Association for a couple of years before it actually adopted the name NFL. Uh, But in year two of those earliest of years, 1921 to be exact, a team in Minneapolis was part of the festivities. Uh, It was called the Minneapolis Marines. And for four years, uh, 1921 through 1924, uh, the Marines were the NFL franchise in the in the Twin Cities area. Um, not a a, a great uh, foray into the NFL. I think in those four seasons they won a total of count them four games. Uh, but this was a, a team that, like a lot of others that joined the early days American Professional Football Association slash NFL, was a very successful independent team uh, in the aughts in the teens. Uh, all the way up until 1919, 1920 or so. Uh, and there were that was literally how pro football kind of got its uh, rough and gruff start was the semi-professional uh, teams, barnstorming and playing uh, rivals and um, playing, you know, for, for gate receipts and whatnot. And uh, 1920 is when uh, some of the originals uh, decided, hey, we should probably some, put some real professional guard wheels around it. And by 1921, the Marines said, okay, we do pretty well here, beating up on everybody in the local regional area here. Uh, let's uh, try our lot with this fledgling group of professional football players known as the NFL. Uh, it didn't work out too well for the Marines. They left after 1924. Uh, they kind of had some remnants kind of stumbling around for a couple of years thereafter. And sure enough, they came back uh, in uh, renewed form, then known as the Red Jackets, the Minneapolis Red Jackets, uh, for two more seasons, 1929 and 1930. And again, in, in those two seasons, winning all of two games. So let's put it this way. The 
Six years in total of the Minneapolis Marines and Minneapolis Red Jackets in the earliest days of the NFL. That's the uh, the story at hand this week as we talk about it with uh, the author of a really cool book just out called Mill City Scrum, the history of Minnesota's first team in the National Football League. His name, the author, is R.C. Christensen, and he is our guest this week. And uh, we highly encourage you to pick up a copy for yourself because it is absolutely part of, and a forgotten part, sadly, of Minneapolis's professional football history. Uh, and we'll get into whether the Vikings uh, have and or should uh, somehow remember and commemorate. Uh, stay tuned. You'll figure out, uh, you'll find out why, frankly, uh, it's relatively easy for the Vikings organization to do. Let's let's leave it at that. Uh, but the book, again, is called Mill City Scrum. It is available uh, for purchase wherever you find good books, uh, Amazon included. And of course, if you go to our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com and search up this episode number 313 with R.C. Christensen, you will find convenient for you a link uh, to said book. And of course, we'll get a couple of shekels of referral love. And it's probably the quickest way you'll be able to get this book uh, is by going through that link and getting it on Amazon and having it delivered to your home, your place of work, your place of domicile, wherever. Hey, maybe it's a, it's a, you've got a trailer somewhere. I don't know, but you can have it delivered just about anywhere Amazon delivers it. And we appreciate you doing so through that means. And again, it's called Mill City Scrum, the history of Minnesota's first team in the National Football League. And um, we're going to waste no more time. We're going to get right into this chat that we had just a few days back. Uh, I learned a lot. And, um, you know, you think you know everything about uh, the NFL and, uh, and and pro football history and stuff. Uh, I knew nothing, absolutely zero about uh, the, the was that there was any professional football history in the Twin Cities prior to the arrival of the Vikings in 61. Uh, and if you're in that category, give a listen. I think you'll enjoy and learn. Uh, here's our conversation we had with uh, RC uh, just a couple days back. Please, as always... Enjoy. How about giving our, our audience a bit of a sense of um, who you are and where you're from? Because I think that probably leads into perhaps why uh, the story of this team slash teams was of interest to you in the first place. Sure. Well, I uh, grew up in Moorhead, Minnesota, which is on the border uh, of North Dakota. And so as an adult, I've lived in Fargo most of my life and um, all lifetime Minnesota Vikings fan. And so I, I wrote a previous book called uh, Border Boys, which is about the 1935 Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And uh, in the process of that, um, I ran across the Minneapolis Marines and as, as an NFL team. And I think I kind of knew about them a little bit before, but um, I looked at it a little further and I thought, oh, you know, I'd like to know more about these guys. And I started looking around and I couldn't find anything. I mean, there was hard. I, I think there's just one um, very short article that was published in the Coffin Corner uh, magazine that the Professional Football Researchers Association uh, organization puts out, and that was back in 1998. But there's like there's like nothing else. And I during my research, I, I learned why <laughs> there's there there isn't uh, anything else been pub there hasn't been anything else published to date. So, well, okay, well let, let's not bury the lead. W w uh, give us a little <laughs> bit of interest as to, as to, as to why. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, look, there's this, sort of that old adage like if you don't see a book about a topic that you're really interested in, well, then you're kind of <laughs> doomed or or uh, you know uh, foreshadowed to to write it. But um, but but why do you think it had to taken so long until you've unearthed it? Well, <clears throat> I think first of all they weren't a very good team, right? So uh, when they got to the NFL. And of course, uh, today's sports fans, um, the NFL began with the Super Bowl era, right? So any, anything before that is um, ignored by a lot of folks, um, except for people like me who are in the Professional Football Research Association. Um, you know, we pay attention to some of this older stuff. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I started um, 
looking around and there wasn't a whole lot there. And I think part and one of the reasons I discovered why there isn't a lot there is because the news, the newspapers, which are the main source of information for this book, they um, unless it was an out of town newspaper uh, where the Minneapolis Marines were going to play. Um, they weren't ever really referred to very often as the Minneapolis Marines. Um, they were simply referred to as the Marines. And the reason for that is um, they were a long standing team in Minneapolis since 1905. And they started out as simply the Marines. And so once I figured that part out and then uh, was able to, you know, um, kind of use good keyword gymnastics, I call it, uh, through uh, some of my searches and things, uh, I was able to finally figure out how to find out information about this team. Um, and then eventually I just, um, you know, now that everything's digitized, not everything, but I'm fortunate that the Minneapolis papers um, are digitized, um, that I, you know, I was able to then, once once I, I knew when they started, then I Besides searches, I could simply go back through, you know, every August or September through December and, and just and just look at the Monday papers. Right. Um, I could obviously I need to look at more than just Monday in order to be able to get good information to make it more like a story. You know, I didn't want just uh, game results. I wanted to know what else was going on. But but yeah, I had to search for, you know, Marine and football. And and I, I learned that the, the organization actually took a name called the Marine Athletic Club at one time. But that wasn't used very often. There, there aren't very, new, very many search results for that. Um, and so it got tricky. It, one of the things I learned was once I found out who was on the team, uh, especially first and last name, then I would just search for their name. And that, and that really helped to kind of narrow things down. And um, and then I also used uh, an Ancestry. Um, I, I, I got pretty good at genealogy when I did my own family tree. And so I used that heavily uh, for this book to really nail down who are these people. And I was able to correct quite a few mistakes. Um, not, not, I shouldn't say quite a few, but um, a handful um, to maybe two handfuls of mistakes uh, that were made previously uh, only because uh, wh whoever had written uh, the article or whatever earlier was going off of whatever the newspaper said, perhaps like in Green Bay. Um, and, it, and it's not that Green Bay was being, uh, you know, mistaken on purpose. It's that whatever information they had, whether it was word of mouth, you know, from the, the people that were there locally in Green Bay, or maybe even stuff that was wired from Minneapolis or who knows, but, you know, some of the people were misidentified, but I was able to, to actually get that straightened out. And um, I did get some things changed on um, some important sites like pro football reference. Uh, but there are still mistakes out there in different university media guides uh, things like that. And so my, my fear is, of course, that the mistakes that are already out there and that have perpetuated um, throughout the, the uh, throughout cyberspace, so to speak, they're just going to pop up again. Right. Because they're that there's sort of an inertia to that. Right. But um, but hopefully my book will help to straighten some things out for people that, you know, want to get uh, information that comes mainly from Minneapolis sources. It also, it also sounds to me a little like perhaps what we've heard in um, some of the old uh, baseball team coverage in the newspapers where it doesn't sound like it was m that much in this case, but perhaps it was as well, sort of the nicknaming of the team. It wasn't an official name per se, or they were referred to as sort of colloquial colloquialisms uh, you know, uh, uh, that, you know, like if the team was, you know, the red stockings or the red socks or the whatever, uh, was, do you think there was any sort of slang or unofficial terminology, especially in their earliest years when they were ram rambling around the, the world of independent football, or was that kind of more of a baseball thing? Do you think? Well, in this particular situation, they actually did have a nickname, uh, Marines and, and, and it was the, it was the, the nickname that was taken from the baseball team that started before the football team started. So the football team comes out of an, uh, a group of um, 
young men who were playing baseball. And then they decided to play football and they were calling themselves the Marines. And uh, so that that perpetuated. Um, but like a lot of times the newspapers, when they reported on them, they didn't call them the Marines. They said the Marine Football Club, you know, no, no S. And so, you know, the word Marine, you know, it's it's quite common just for military from the military aspect, but it's also um, quite common, uh, you know, from nautical aspect, right? So you've got um, marine um, uh, related to boats and things like that. And and Minnesota has a lot of lakes. And so, you know, the word marine by itself doesn't really get you anywhere. You got to start really, you know, um, using more keywords to be able to find the stuff you need to find. Uh, and one last thing on on the name then um there was was there ever any uh friction shall we say about that name now, obviously this, we're in a pro team until the early 1920s and we can we'll get into the story a little later what we would call professional football that, that at that time was hardly what we know pro football to be today but one does wonder if the actual marines overseen by the United States government cared or even knew about uh, a, a team that had sort of their nickname, so to speak. Hmm. I don't see any indication of that. Um, in fact, currently, if you look up, for example, on Facebook and look up Minneapolis Marines, you actually find a, 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 a page that's run by a, um, uh, a, a U.S. Marines uh, uh, detachment that's in Minneapolis. <laughs> and I don't, I, and I would guess they don't even know that this team ever existed. <laughs> to be honest with you, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's nothing else out there, you know, that indicates that there's any relationship between the two, and and still the name itself, we we don't know whether it actually was a military reference or not. Except later on, newspapers kind of ref- used, you know, adjectives to describe these guys uh, in a in a military fashion, um, um, and sometimes like merchant marines too. So, you know, the so, sort of uh, um, the, the military support, uh, <clears throat> you know, nautical system. So I, you know, I, you know, we don't know where the where the name comes from. So, well, that's interesting. I, I you know, and and again, that's probably more for the, um, I don't know, the entrepreneur out there that wants to take the logo at some point and make some T-shirts and stuff. I, be careful out there because I'm sure that. Uh, the, the current Marines probably will not be too happy with uh, the uh, resurrection of, of that team for uh, commercial purposes. All right. But it does seem to me, based on my cursory read of, of, of your book and uh, some other stuff that I've sort of uh, in my crack research for this, um, it feels to me like there's almost like sort of three distinct components to the story of this team. And the center of it is 1920 when the beginnings of what then became ultimately became the NFL – came about um the, but there was obviously years before that right where professionalism and football were not necessarily easily commingled or perhaps even confused with each other uh and this is a team much like most of the other ones that um found themselves in 1920 or so uh trying to make a go of this professional thing were very much um amateur at that and a, a very ragtag uh, kind of uh, form of, of of football, whether you call it professional or more, it's probably more collegiate at that point, right? Um, well, they, I mean, they they were, you know, there's different ways to define professional, and of course, well, one of them is to say is that you know all the players are getting paid, as opposed to maybe one or two you know good players that are maybe brought in to play or something like that. Um, and by 1912, so this team started in 1905, and they were just a sandlot team. They were playing other, you know, groups of young men that just wanted to play football. Uh, but by 19, um, 1910, they started to get a little more serious. They they started doing what you know side bets or 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 or, or prize purses, or what however you want to put it. Um, and then by 1912, they um, they rented a venue. Uh, they charged admission. They had thousands of fans show up. And, and then they divvied up the net profits amongst all the players. And so 
Um, it was more of a cooperative style way of earning money. The the guys didn't have any kind of salary, uh, but they together uh, were a professional operation uh, and they were all getting paid in, in that manner. So, um, but that's, that's not, you know, um, an uncommon thing necessarily for these early uh, uh, professional teams. Um, and then there's another definition uh, for professional, which is that they have a coach. Uh, and this is more a more elevated def- definition of professional, where they have a coach that comes from a system. And so that that happened in 1913. Uh, they brought in a, a coach from the University of uh, Minnesota. He was a player who didn't play anymore because of studies and things like that. But he, he came and coached the team. His name was Ossie Solom. He went on to coach... Um, well, Syracuse, um, uh, I think it was Iowa, other other different places, and um, so he he, beca- he became a, a significant coach uh, after he had coached this, you know, this this city team called the Marines. Where were the where was the source of the players though? They were probably coming out of some level of collegiate play, right? Because at that point, the college game was really essentially kind of the only real. I don't know, persistent and regulated, I guess, uh, version of the game in town, right? Well, yeah, but it, there was the University of Minnesota was in town, but then also there was other universities that had football teams. Um, uh, the It's now called the University of St. Thomas, uh, College of St. Thomas at that time. Um, McAllister College, Hamlin University, um, and then there was a Concordia University. Uh, they all had teams. Um, and then... And then, of course, the high schools had teams. And, and very early on, it's important to know that in the early um, ni- uh, 1900s, uh, the, the the high school teams would actually play the college teams. Um, and so and it was kind of a weird eligibility thing there, I think, in terms of the ages of the players sometimes. So I, I'd have to look into that a little more. But it seems like it's a little more um, odd that way. But um, but, yeah, so there was, you know, there was a lot of college uh uh, talent in town, but the Marines did not have college talent. Uh, they, not until 1913, when a uh, college football Hall of Famer uh, named Bobby Marshall joined the team, uh, then he was the first significant college player on the team. Uh, before that, I think maybe it was 1910, there was a player who had some college experience, but it was from a really small college in St. Mary's, Kansas. His last name is Costello. Uh, he played in the backfield uh, uh, for the Marines. And, you know, he was pretty good and things like that. Um, but um, but that was the only thing until 1913. And then they get and then they get Bobby Marshall. But then from then on, there there wasn't a whole lot of college talent that came in to the Marines until after World War One. So, I mean, give us a, a bit of a sense of how these uh how these games sort of came about, like how many were there in a quote unquote season? Who who were the Marines playing against? Mm-hmm. Um, was there any sort of form of, I, I guess, any kind of schedule, so to speak? And, and were records kept and that kind of stuff? Because it, fe- it feels very um, loose, shall we say, to me. Well, yeah, it was it was. Um... Well, the, just like uh, the other, you know, even in the Sandlot times, it was, it, of course, in the Sandlot t- times, it was loose. But even as they grew into professional team, it was loose in terms of schedule because, you know, a lot of these early professional teams, <clears throat> they had to find opponents and build a schedule as uh, as they could because they didn't, they weren't part of the league, right? So, um, so yeah, early on, uh, you know, when they were in the Sandlots, uh, from about 1905 to 1909, they were, they would play other Sandlot teams. Um, there was an, their main rival, uh, at that time was a team called, uh, the Indians and the, the Indians had a, um, over the years, uh, had a significant family involved, uh, by the last name of Irgens. Um, in, at least in terms of local independent football. Uh, so it was the, the brothers. It was uh, Einar Irgens and his, and his brothers. Um, and uh, th- three of the brothers, not Einar, uh, but three of the brothers ended up playing for the Minneapolis Marines. And um, Einar actually managed the Marines once. But 
that was their significant rival in the Sandlot. Sandlots, the Marines absorbed them. Then they get to that sort of semi-professional stage, and they're playing teams like the Beavers in Minneapolis. Um, and then they're playing the Laurels of St. Paul. And now the, at that time, by the time the the, the Marines are, are playing in a semi-professional way, um, they just got that one guy, Costello, you know, that had any kind of college experience. Uh, but the other teams, the Beavers and Laurels, they had college guys, and they had high, guys with high school experience. But the Marines didn't even have the high school experience to, to, to carry with them. The Marines, for, until, um, you know, un, until – after World War One, when they started acquiring a bunch of college players, um, through that whole period of 1905 uh, through uh, 1917, these players were largely uh, just working class immigrants uh, from the south side of Minneapolis. I mean, there's a few that were a little further away in Minneapolis than the south side, but there was this pretty much, you know, centered on the neighborhood called the Cedar Riverside neighborhood, and that neighborhood is from that time famous for its uh, Scandinavian immigrant population. But there was more than Scandinavians that were there, and that was reflected on the team. So give me a sense then of this, uh, the, the interlude that was World War I and a, a flu pandemic, right? Which kind of mm-hmm. put the kibosh on lots of different things, not only just, you know, football games, right? But uh, uh, give, give us a sense of that, because I, I got to think that it was, a, it was a pretty good gig for most of these players at least as a side hustle, uh, until maybe that sort of uh, that gap in time occurred. And and then coming out of that, it seems like that was almost sort of an impetus for maybe trying to solidify something more than what was prior to 1919. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, prior prior to that time, they were a dominant team. And and um, they they were outscoring opponents um, 10 to one. And, and, and over the course of, of several years. And, um, and then once they get to the war, um, of course, uh, then, then a lot of the players uh, enlisted. And, and they, you know, the war, we were at war technically starting in 1917, but, the, but the, the Marines did play a season in 1917. In fact, that was the season that kind of, uh, you know, started all the, <clears throat> the bad vibes for the Marines because the, the, in 1917, the Marines were, were so good that, uh, the Rock Island independence, um, after they played the Marines said, said, uh, offered the, the guys, uh, it was a, uh, uh, you know, a, a handful of the players, uh, a good sum of money, seven hundred and fifty bucks, I think was it was was the total for the for the group of players uh, at that time uh, to come and play one game and and to play their rival uh, Davenport. And then one of the Marines players all, was also paid. Bobby Marshall was paid to play for Davenport uh, in Iowa, and um, and that event. Uh, portended um, uh, bad times for the Marines in the future uh, because after after the war, um, several of the Marines went and played for Rock Island to Rock Island's advantage. Rock Island had a tremendous year in 1919. And so if you combine the scoring for Rock Island in 1919 with, with the scoring for um, Minneapolis Marines from 1912 to 1917, um, it's an eleven to one scoring uh, <clears throat> ratio. So they they're just incredible this team, and and part of it is because they were using this offense um, that was developed, um, you know, by the uh, the Gophers coach, uh, Dr. Henry L. Williams. He developed a a shift called the Minnesota Shift. Interesting. So I mean, in essence, this was really kind of the only, uh, if you will, pro. A lot of it's pro game in town, but um, I, I, I get besides that sort of unique uh, use of the university's uh, uh, offensive system, um, what else? I mean, it seems like they had ringers or maybe they were finding talent uh, that was uh, not on other people's radars. Or frankly, they were playing competition that really just wasn't... Uh, you know, wasn't up to their their level of play. I, why do you, why do you think they were so dominant? Um, well, 
they um well they they had the basically the same players um with with very few changes in the roster for years um and they would slowly absorb their their rivals as they beat them okay so um uh, so very for, as early as 1907, they had their their captain uh, Ruben Ursella is his name. He was their quarterback. He was their signal signal caller. He was an incredible punter, and um, he's also the guy that was the coach for the Minnesota Shift part of it, um, because they were using that before they ever got their their uh, system coach uh, Aussie Solom. So they were using that two years before then. So, um, <clears throat> so it was Ruben Ursella that was leading the team, and and he he's the one that that led them the Gophers to use, or excuse me, the Minneapolis Marines to use the the Gophers uh, Minnesota shift system. And how he learned how to do that, I, I'll never know probably because he had to have just watched the Gophers play or talked to Gophers players maybe in the pool hall or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but. Um, uh, I think I, th- I kind of got lost here. What was the original question? Well, no, I'm just curious as to how they became so darn good and so on, a, on such a regular basis. Perhaps with the exception of the the Gophers All Stars, which they played on a, on occasion, and for some reason they had their number, but but not for the rest of the teams they seemed to play. Right. Yep. Um, and so yeah, the 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 All Stars. Um, so at, at, they would play an annual game starting in. It was actually 1913 for the Marines, and the basically the be, the best team in town was invited to play the Minnesota All Stars. In 1912, that happened to be the Beavers, but then the Marines beat the Beavers in 1913, and then from then on, it was the Marines for quite some time that would play the Minnesota All Stars. And the Minnesota All Stars was made up of. Um, you know, former golfers players, and um, most of them were not too far removed from from uh, university play, and they had played under Dr. Henry L. Williams. And the Minnesota at that time was was a dominant uh, college football team, and so you know they were all uh, well versed in how to play football, <clears throat> and and so you know they were a tough opponent. Um, there weren't very many games though that where the the Minnesota All Stars you know, uh, were, were trouncing the, the Marines necessarily. The, the, the Marines were holding their own. Um, but um, you, one of the things you need to know about that, though, is every time the Marines would play the All-Stars on Thanksgiving Day, um, they had played a Sunday game before, right? So the Marines were all were always playing that game on, you know, just, you know, uh, four days rest or three days rest, however you look at it. And so, um, so yeah, the, the, the all-stars tend to beat them, but the Marines were also tired there at the end of the season. They were, they were, uh, you know, battered up. Uh, this was their last game of the season generally, and they had just played four days before, and then they play the all-stars and it was mostly cause it was good money, you know? <clears throat> and, and so describe the money and then maybe describe to me perhaps, uh, what the existence of these players was like, like how much could they devote to this? Do they have time to practice? What, what were their, ostensibly, I'm, I'm assuming they had day jobs and multiple day jobs at that, right? They weren't making a full-time living doing this. Right. No, yeah, they, they were all working. And um, they they practiced at night. Um, uh, and so, you know, earlier in the season, that's easier, right? Um, but later in the season, then they're having to, you know, play in the streets under, you know, the street lamps back then weren't great. Um, and then, or they, you know, uh, as uh, the automobile came into more, more into focus into Vogue or whatever, then there'd be automobile headlights lighting up the, the, the area. Um, yeah, they, they, even though they started in Nicollet Park, uh, the, uh, where the uh, Minneapolis Millers baseball team played, um, in, in the, and the Marines started that as their home venue in, in 1915, uh, Nicollet Park didn't have lights. And so, or, you know, so it was, um, it was always having to have some kind of, you know, they, there was like searchlights and things they could rent. And so they would, they'd find ways to light up the place so that they could practice. So tell me about 19, so 1918, right? The, the flu pan- pandemic and, and the, the, the first world war pretty much had shut down much, if not all of independent football at that time. But come 1919, it seems like a bunch of teams sort of try to make a comeback, but 
for whatever reasons, the Marines seem to have a tougher time trying to uh, recreate, I guess, what had been a pretty solid and financially remunerative and successful decade until then playing football in a quote unquote professional variety. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so the Marines after the war, um, in in some respects, they were still a, a great team. I mean, they, I mean, over those two years from 1919 to 1920, they had a 10, two and four record. And and so it's it's not like, you know, they were doing terrible. Um, and. But I mean, they, they had, were playing. They had lost a bunch of players, though, to some right, other, they, to another right. team or two. So, in other words, they weren't dominant anymore, is what the thing was, right? So, they were still winning games, but they weren't dominant because their best players had gone to Rock Island, um, and so they were backfilling the team from some, uh, you know, some of the uh, rivals that they had faced. Um, also, you know, some of these uh, players during the war, you know, might have played on some service teams and things like that. And so it's, le- it's not that they weren't practiced in football necessarily. Uh, but by 1920, you know, the Minneapolis Marines, they were playing um, uh, in, in some some instances uh, uh, NFL teams. They were it was the APFA, of course, at the time. But uh, they were they were playing some NFL teams on their schedule. Uh, and so. Um, the main thing with the Marines in terms of decline is their is their decline actually started in 1914. So in 19, <clears throat> even though they were really successful, and w- what I talk about decline, I mean in fan uh, interest. So in 1913, they beat their their um, their city rivals, uh, uh, the Beavers, and then they basically absorbed the Beavers. And it's like fan interest just sort of fell off after that, uh, and part of that is because uh, the mini because there was such a high interest in 1913 in this independent professional uh, teams, um, the the city of Minneapolis um, got together with St. Paul and they hired a guy and they they started a park league football system and that st- started in 1914. Um, and w- w- in short order, they had over a hundred teams and, you know, by the late 1920s, they had like 150 teams playing. Now this is, you know, all different levels, but they had a, uh, what they called a senior heavy, uh, level where the adults played as well. And, um, the fans in general, they were much more interested in watching, you know, the Gophers or, um, these amateur teams, uh, they weren't all that interested in the, uh, in the Marines. And so part of that is that the, the Marines weren't making as much money at home. So they actually had to go play teams farther afield. So that's why in 1917, you know, they went and played Davenport in Iowa. They played Brock Island, um, uh, Duluth superior. They, the, the, you know, that's where they were reaching out to. And so, uh, they were having to go f- farther to, to find games. So give me a sense then. So uh, the Rock Island independents were kind of a, a where a bunch of former Marines, former Marines, it sounds like they were I know. <laughs> that, uh, that uh, found themselves when uh, this American Professional Football Association, the precursor to what became the NFL, but in retroactive goodness, was ostensibly the first ever season of the NFL, 1920. Um, describe sort of the Marines in 1920, because they could not have not known about this new, quote unquote, truly fully professional league that was starting. And it was clear that it was attracting some of their former players. Um, They had to be chomping at the bit somehow to figure out a way either to either up their game or somehow get involved in the league themselves somehow. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the, one of the things that was going on after the after the 1920 season, um, you know, the, the that early NFL, the American Professional Football Association, started out pretty rough, and um, you know there was a lot of disagreements and things between owners, and there was um, quite a movement in from multiple directions to either have a to split it into conferences, have a Western Conference. Um, or to start a Western, Western, so to speak, league in Western being, you know, Minneapolis, Iowa, you know, that, that would be West. Okay. And, um, 
to, to start a, a Western league that would compete with them or, or to have a conference. And, and like I said, there was multiple fronts on that. There was uh, some kind of organ, organizer down in Nebraska, you know, that was, that was trying to get something started. And, and, you know, there were, there were teams kind of all over in that area. And so, um, it kind of just kind of shook out that the, you know, I'm wondering if, you know, John, it seems like the John Dunn who ended up being a, a pretty important figure in all of this, uh, he became the NFL franchise owner and he was the manager for the Marines for several years. Uh, he seemed to get along with a lot of different people pretty well. And, and it seems like when they, they played, you know, some NFL teams, uh, in in uh, 1920 um, that, you know, he probably got to know them pretty well. And, you know, then they sort of invited him in, I'm guessing. Um, so I'm looking at the schedule right now for 1920. Um, they played the Decatur Staley's and 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 then they also played some precursors to other NFL teams like they played uh, Duluth City, which was a precursor to the Duluth Kellys of the NFL. Um, and so, you know, they, I, you know, who knows, maybe Dunn got to know Hallis pretty well with the, with the Staley's and, and, and they invited him in. But I also was able to, um, get out of, uh, this research that, you know, uh, the NFL, uh, president Joe Carr, uh, he, he really wanted Minneapolis, uh, to be part of, of the league because, you know, Minneapolis was, you know, an important industrial center. And it was, it was just growing. It was growing like crazy. And, um, I, and, and of course, because of all the, uh, you know, the manufacturing and, and, and the, and the milling and everything that was going on there, it was, you know, there's, there's lots of trains that go to Minneapolis, right? So it, it's not like you couldn't get there to play a game. So, um, I think he really wanted to, to have a presence in Minneapolis. Minneapolis itself, fan wise just wasn't ready for pro football. Well, I think a lot of people weren't ready for pro football. I mean, in some yeah. respects yes, but but you know, I think it's lost on a lot of people that you know, this first year of the soon to be NFL's existence, the AP uh FA, I mean, we're talking about 13 teams, 11 of them had ostensibly homes and there were two traveling teams in the mix and you know, as you were hinting at before, it was pretty rough is kind of a, a gentle word for it. Right. Because, um, you know, the schedules were pretty fluid. Uh, there was a lot of play, uh, not just amongst themselves as a quote unquote league, but to your point, you know, there were, there were a bunch of teams that were playing independence too, some of which that ultimately became members of, of the, the league. Um, so I, I, I got to think that because I uh, Minneapolis was not the only team that joined in that second season into the mix, right? So there's clearly there were some other, shall we say, semi-pro, fairly well-established, independent-type teams that, for whatever reasons, didn't have their act together or weren't invited or weren't part of the original club or, or whatever it was that um, were probably uh, looking at, at things there and saying, well, let's try to figure out a way to get in. Mm -hmm. and let's see if let's see if it's around for another year for us to get in to actually get in. Well, and I think that the um, it, it, one of the re reasons I think there was a real strong desire by Carr to have Minneapolis in in the league um, is because um, and and maybe like I said, just John John Dunn had become friends with Hallis. Um, one of the reasons. Um, for that is because in 1922, um, the owners elected John Dunn, the the manager and, and NFL franchise owner for the Minneapolis Marines, to be NFL vice president. Okay, so you had the president, you had the vice president, you had the secretary, and um, John Dunn served as NFL vice president from 1922 to 1928, including in um, uh, Let's see, 25, 26, 27, and 28. So four years when he didn't even have a team on the field in the NFL. So he was still NFL vice president then. And then after he ended up, uh, you know, calling it quits after 1930, um, Carr would, would still come to, to Minneapolis and, um, and meet with Dunn and, and say, hey, you should start up your franchise again. So, 
you know, it, I think they really wanted Minneapolis to be part of all this. Well, sure. But it also <clears throat> people also uh, need to remember that, you know, the first year was uh, f- roughly, well, it was 14 teams. Um, 1921, um, it went up to 21 teams, right? So you're, you're talking about a lot of, lot of uh, uh, independent, semi-pro, a lot of uh, – uh, a lot of entities in the Midwest and the Northeast, a little bit in the central region too, that were kind of forming this idea that, you know, there, there could be some real play. And my understanding is that 1921 was a little bit more formalized as a league in terms of standings, counting and that kind of stuff. I think if I'm not mistaken, independent team games were still allowed, but they wouldn't be counted towards uh, one standing in the, uh, in the league itself, but um, it still probably speaks to the fact that there was a lot of semi-pro and and pretty darn good teams outside of the league thus far that were in it to make a buck or so too, and it worked for everybody's benefit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean there was some good competition still outside of the league. Um, one of the one of the things that I point to is in those in those um, in that 1920 uh, season when. The, the Marines were still outside of the NFL because they didn't join until 21. Um, you had that um, you had the the Rock Island Independents who were still doing really well, not as well as 1919, uh, but they still had the former Marines on their team. They actually added um, a, a couple more uh, that weren't there in 1919. And um, and and. Uh, and Rock Island was in the league at that point in 1920, but Minneapolis was outside the league. But between the two teams, they they play um, the independent Rock Island Independents played uh, the Staley's um, twice, and the Minneapolis Marines pl- played the Decatur Staley's once. And then, of course, this is the future Chicago Bears. There's 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 Hall of Famers on this team, um, but across those three games, the Staley's only scored ten points. And yes, they either won or tied each of those games. Um, but it just makes you wonder if the Marines had stuck together and didn't and didn't have some guys, you know, head, head to Rock Island, if if they might have done a little bit better against those Decatur Staley's. All right, what's this? Four seventeen helmets. My goodness. Well, you've heard me talk about 417helmets.com, collectible helmets and more on this uh, very show uh, fairly often. Our pal Judd Lesher down in uh, southwest Missouri, I think in the Springfield, Missouri area, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, What is it? 417helmets.com. Well, first, if you dig uh, all of our great football stories and episodes of the past and you'd like to commemorate some of them in mini helmet form really cool sort of literal high quality professionally you know made materials but in a mini format that you could put on your desk or uh put on your uh, in your bookshelf or whatever it is uh and just about every league that's ever existed save from the nfl uh we're talking xfl uh old versions of uh the wfl remember the world football league how about various teams both current and past in the canadian football league but also NCAA teams of your and NAIA college football teams of your, all of them and many, many, many more available for you at 417helmets.com. But, oh, that's not it. That's not it, friends. There's plenty more to be had. How about mini baseball helmets? Yeah, uh, a whole bunch in the Negro Leagues. And, yes, officially licensed by the Negro League Hall of Fame. You can get a bunch, and they're making more uh, all the time. And by the way, custom helmets can be made too, both of the baseball and the football variety. You got your uh, your business, uh, uh, maybe a promotional thing you want to do for your company, uh, perhaps your organization, you want to raise some funds, all that kind of stuff. Great custom approaches to both mini football and mini baseball helmets can be made uh, at uh, your uh, command uh, for uh, uh, you to enjoy and to sell or resell or give away all of that and more. That's the more part at 417helmets.com. It's collectible helmets and more. And uh, we've got a promo code for you, too, for whatever you purchase, all of them, all of your purchases, 10% off all of those uh, when you use the promo code GOODSEATS. 
Again, promo code GOODSEATS for 10% off all of your purchases at 417helmets.com. Thanks, Judd, and uh, thank you all for listening and trying them out. And now back to our conversation. Well, tell me about their NFL years, though, because from 21 through... 1924. I, so I, I know they played full seasons in 21, 22, and 23. Did, did they fold in the midst of the 1924 season, or did they just did they just play just a smaller amount of games and and complete the season in, in 24? Their last as the Marines in the now NFL. Yeah. So um, in 1924, they. They they played out their season, but they there was some um, I think there were some some games that they had hoped to play like on the way home as like money makers, um, and they but those would have been against teams that were not in the NFL, um, and so um, let's see I'm I'm looking at the at the schedule right now, um, yeah because they went all the way out to um, Philadelphia. To play Frankfurt Yellow Jackets, they also uh, played the Providence Steamroller, um, and they were supposed to have. They had some, some hope, hopefully some games that they were going to play on the way home, and then they they didn't. I think at, by that point, um, John Dunn's uh, bank account was just bleeding too much, and they decided not to. And so <clears throat> they did come home, and they they all they played another local team called the the Liberties. Which had a significant players on uh, on that team, but um, they uh, um, but then at, at, by that point, John Dunn was like, "Boy, this is I, this is getting expensive," <laughs> so he didn't he didn't continue with the franchise at so, that point. So why do you think then? I mean, you probably hinted at it before, but I mean, why do you think they were so night and day different as a full fledged professional team, especially even with the benefits of playing independence and money making? touring and all that kind of stuff versus their sheer dominance as a true independent prior to joining the league. I mean, it just seems like it was like you could draw a, a very sharp line between the before and the professional after with this team. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It had, had pretty much everything to, to do with the fact that the, um, those, those key players uh, left for Rock Island. We're talking players like Ruben Ursella went to Rock Island, Fred Chicken. Okay. There was right, a guy. Before you go further, we got to talk about Fred Chicken because it's the best <laughs> name ever. I mean, I think perhaps on the all time best. Fr- Who was Fred Chicken besides just it seeming it could be a, a fast food chain name in, in, uh, in hiding. It, yeah. And do you know how hard it is to find Fred Chicken in a search? You get fried chicken, right? So, (laughs) but um, yeah, Fred Chicken was, uh, he was from Minneapolis. Um, He did play uh, high school football, Uh, but then he, for a number of years before he ever uh, played uh, football outside of high school, um, he he actually played uh, minor league uh, professional baseball uh, up in uh, Canada and out west uh, on the on, in in the on the Pacific Coast area, um, and but then he also played during basketball season. He would play for a team that was touring as far west as Montana and things like that. And so, you know, he's playing basketball and he's playing uh, pro- professional uh, baseball, um, and then. I guess at some point they um, so after um, this uh, their first ma- the the first real manager that the team had that started in 1910 his name was Frank Hammer he was a newspaperman uh, he um, he he picked up Bobby Marshall and then very shortly afterward picked up Fred Chicken um, that now the Fred Chicken's brother Joe Joe Chicken also played um, uh, he, he had. He played with the uh, the Minneapolis Deans, which was a, a precursor to the Marines. It was a professional team that had a two year run in 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 uh, Minneapolis, and so um, you know Fred Chicken was really familiar with this idea of professional football. And I suppose at that at that point he decided to, to play for the Marines. Um, so just so everybody knows, Chicken wasn't his real last name. So he his real last name is Slepica, um, and it. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right. S S L E P I C A, and um, that is Czech 
for hen or chicken. So he just went by chicken because I suppose that's what you know most people understood, or maybe he kind of smiled about it. Who knows? When he played baseball, he went by Fred Chick. Oh, interesting. Well, this is this is like a, a branding exercise with this guy. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, and then I also read, too, that um, he went on to become an accountant uh, 30, for 36 years with the same company right after after his pro career. So, there, yeah. I mean, the the, uh, the 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 I didn't mean to di- uh, derail with the Fred Chicken story, but OK, so the independents got the qual- quality players and it was four years of seemingly futile efforts um, as this Marines team in the what by, by 1924 had become the National Football League. So whimpering away, they went. But they, but the team or the idea of a team came back. Do you want to tell us the sort of the the seeds of, of how a team came back to Minneapolis and and how much it was related to the Marines and maybe was it not related at all? It was just sort of picking up a few years later with another attempt. Yeah, it's a, it's it's actually absolutely re- related. So there's a direct bloodline uh, between the Minneapolis re- Marines and what came later, which w- which was the Minneapolis Red Jackets, but. To know, you know, what is that through, you know, through uh, uh, way to the from one from A to B, right? How do you get there? Well, at the end of 1924, um, John Dunn, who owned the NFL franchise um, and was still NFL vice president at the time, he was actually trying to woo the city of Rochester, Minnesota, which is where the big Mayo Clinic is. Um, he was trying to woo them to be the uh, the location for his NFL franchise. I'm assuming Joe Carr would have been okay with that. I mean, you know, uh, he he probably would have talked to him about it, um, which it would have been an interesting thing because it wasn't nearly as big of a city. Um, but but Rochester rejected him, and then Rochester he went he approached them again in the spring of 1925, and they rejected him. And then it was it wasn't actually until that 1925 in the spring after he was rejected by Rochester that he decided, well, we're not going to field the team. Okay. So it, it was, it was more of a, you know, a dwindling thing, right. From, from the end of the 1924 season through 1925 for him to make that decision. Um, But then we get this real interesting thing that happens in 1926. So he, he actually in 1926, decides, okay, we're going to revive this thing. And we're not going to call it the Minneapolis Marines. Um, We don't want it to be Minneapolis focused. We're going to call it the Twin City Lumberjacks. And of course, anyone who follows baseball knows that the Minnesota Twins baseball team has a TC logo, which stands for Twin Cities, right? And and so, um, so, yeah, he he was going to revive the, the team as the Twin City Lumberjacks. He actually signed players uh, um, to contracts, and um, he had investors. And one of the investors was going to be the coach. Uh, his name is Joe Brandy, and he had been the coach at the College of St. Thomas. Um, actually, I think he was the coach also for the the Marines in the in 1924, I believe. And um, he, um, <clears throat> but then they get down to wherever the, the NFL meeting is, I can't remember if it's, it's on the East coast. They get, the, they get to the meeting and, um, or before the meeting and Joe Brandy tells John Dunn, I, I don't want to be an investor. Apparently he hadn't actually given his money yet because they hadn't paid their franchise fee. And he said, I don't want to be an investor. I just want to be paid a salary. And so at that point I'm, I'm get I'm, you know, John Dunn must not have had the money. And so then he decided at that point they weren't going to field a Twin City Lumberjacks team. And so we had the NFL almost had a, a team called the Twin City Lumberjacks. Uh, it was all set to go. They just needed some cash that didn't show up. So then the they went forth, though, with the notion of a Red Jackets that was that took a couple more years though. So what happened was, um, so yeah, like I'm curious as to how the Red Jackets came into came into being then at the latter sure. decade. Yeah, it's clear though that, that there's interest in pro football still in Minneapolis. Well, there's interest at least in John Dunn fielding a team. <laughs> yeah. So um, so what happened then was in 1927. So that was the 
the the year after so the the AFL remember was in 1926 and um and after that uh Red Grange's uh, New York Yankees joined the NFL uh for the 1927 season and John Dunn put together uh, a Marines team to play one game against the NFL New York Yankees uh, in Minneapolis. And so there was a Marines team, technically not an NFL team, but just an independent Marine Minneapolis Marines team in 1927 that played an NFL team in an exhibition game. Then in 1928, um, there was a gentleman at the University of Minnesota, a, a great fullback. He had set records uh, at the University of Minnesota in, in uh, rushing yards and in touchdowns. His name was Herb Josting. And, and, you know, he was, he, after seeing how Red Grange got paid, <laughs> Herb Josting thought, well, I should get paid too. And so when he became available uh, for the 1928 season, uh, he held out for good pay that never came. And so what he did then is he um, he worked with John Dunn, and I think John Dunn basically formed reformed the Minneapolis Marines as an independent professional team that season for two games uh, with Herb Josting as the featured player, and they went and played the Packers and the Bears, and they didn't they didn't play them in Minneapolis. They went to Green Bay and they went to Chicago, and I think. You know, it, in some respects, it was just a oh, it was it was kind of an advertisement for Herb Josting, right? And, and and hopefully then he would get signed. Well, that didn't happen either. So in then we get to 1929, and Herb Josting still wants to play. And and what happened was after that Chicago Bears game in 1928, where Josting was in Chicago, um, some it was either right after or right before. John Dunn's father died, and my impression is is that the family had some money and that John Dunn probably would have inherited some. And so at, at that point, I think uh, maybe John Dunn felt a little more flush with cash, and then he decided, okay, we're going to revive this team, and Herb Josting is going to be the featured player, and he is going to um, – and he's going to be the coach and the voice of the team. So it was kind of a strange thing. In early 1929, there's talk about an NFL franchise or an NFL, NFL team starting up in Minneapolis, and um, they didn't have a name for it yet. But it but it was Herb Josting that was going to start this team supposedly. Well, by the time you get you know to the fall, you find out well it's actually John Dunn that that is uh, <clears throat> you know leading uh, this effort. Uh, but Herb Josting was I think at, by that point people were maybe tired of the idea of the Marines and even tired of the idea of maybe John Dunn running things. And so they, they put Herb Josting out front as, as the face of the franchise, so to speak. Interesting. Well, it's, it, it's clear that uh, the idea of pro football was, uh, was still rumbling about, but uh, to, to no, no better ends though. And you could not have picked uh, perhaps a better or worse year, shall we say, than 1929 to re-enter uh, the pro game in 1929-1930, besides all the macroeconomic things around, um, it, it, the fortunes of this team, regardless of the new name and 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 setup, uh, wasn't any better. No, no, and and yeah, so you had the you had um, uh, stock stock market crash right in 1929, um, and of course that didn't have effects on the little guy right away right um as much as the, as the people that had money but uh but but so they did play a season in, in 29 and they actually you know had some attendance you know i mean in uh, in in 1929 that um it, it, one thing i i i found was the 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 Red Jackets, so we're talking about the Minneapolis Red Jackets now. And by the way, the Minneapolis Red Jackets is a reference, I, I believe. I, I guess I don't know this for sure. But it, it seems to be a reference to another, mili another military reference. So the, the, the 1st Minnesota um, Regiment, which fought in the Civil War, they all wore red shirts in the Civil War because that's all they had. And so, um, and so I... I my impression is that that is where they get the name. There was also an actual 
uh, a polo team at Fort Snelling. The Army had a polo team, and they called themselves the Red Jackets, and that was an earlier in the 20s. And so um, you sort of draw that line, and it seems like that's where they get the name. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, um, uh, yeah, so so they, they started this Red Jackets team. Um, and one thing I was going to say is when you look at the attendance figures that the, that the Red Jackets got, they weren't necessarily any worse than some of the attendance figures you saw elsewhere in the NFL for some of these teams that are still here today. But I think those other teams must have had bigger war chests, bigger, you know, they, they bigger sponsors. They were in bigger venues, right? Uh, they were in bigger, they were in bigger, uh, cities and, um, and for whatever reason, uh, the, the Red Jackets couldn't make a, make a go of it, even if their att- attendance was kind of similar to other teams. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, th- there are teams playing in baseball stadiums now, at that point, right? The Dodgers were playing at Ebbets Field. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Bears were playing at Wrigley. And the Cardinals in Chicago were playing at Comiskey. I mean, you know, these are the polo grounds for the New York uh, football giants, right? So these are, you know, these are pretty large stadiums uh, i wouldn't say they're necessarily full for football but but it's still it it's it's spoke to ambition at least and i'm sure had a, a big crowd or two and i cannot imagine that the red jackets would not have benefited from a couple of visits from some of these big name teams like the bears and the cardinals and the giants and maybe even the dodgers right for, for well yeah the gate they Yes, they had a significant crowd when Bronco Nagurski, who played for the University of Minnesota, uh, when he returned with the Bears to play in 1930 against the Red Jackets, they had a really good sized crowd. And so, um, and, and so, yeah, there there was you know a couple of a couple of games there, but you know, I, it would be interesting to really know the economics of things. Uh, you know how you know. <sighs> You know, how did that all play out? Because, um, uh, you know, there was I mean, one of the complaints with uh, that was brought up in some of these NFL meetings early on um, was that, you know, early on when they were making uh, when they were they were putting together schedules and things, I don't think those schedules even in the league were necessarily, um, you know, set in stone. And then it's it sounded like. You know, some of the some of the bigger teams would just cancel games. You know, if they if they thought, oh, we're not going to make any money if we go play these people, then they just they just cancel. Them. So, um, uh, yeah, the Marines, you know, or excuse me, the Red Jackets. Eventually, they were, you know, by that time, there were the I think the schedules were more solid than the than the early Marines when they were playing in 1921 through 1924. Um, but but the, there was no real interest in Minneapolis enough. Um, and so, uh, you know, they, they ended up having to play a lot of road games and hoping that they would, they would benefit from gate receipts and, or, and, or the guarantee, however they worked that out. I don't know if they only received the guarantee maybe uh, on those road trips, but, um, you know, it was expensive to travel (laughs) and, um, and they weren't doing very well. And, Teams didn't want to come to Minneapolis either because there was no interest in in professional football anymore, really, in Minneapolis, except for like a game when Bronco Nagurski comes. Uh, John Dunn, he tried to get like the New York Giants to come to Minneapolis to play a midweek game because, you know, everybody wanted to play the Giants. He tried to get them midweek uh, to play under the lights in the evening uh, at the College of St. Thomas, which had lights. And the Giants didn't want anything to do with it. So um, they had a hard time, uh, you know, getting an attraction to come play them. And their demise after 1930 season, it uh, looks like most of the, the a lot of the team, uh, was it officially a merger with Frankfurt? <laughs> that's, that's still an open question. Um, what we do know is that they so after these are the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets, by the way, in suburban. Was it suburban Philadelphia, pretty much? I guess I don't know if that's suburban or not, <laughs> but it's Philadelphia area or Philadelphia, yeah. Um, but the uh, so after November second, um, so both both Frankfurt, the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets, and the Minneapolis Red Jackets played the Chicago teams on the same day. 
in uh, I think that was the November 2nd in 1930. And so there's no record of what actually happened, but you can about imagine that John Dunn met with the Frankfurt Athletic Association guys there in Chicago and said, hey, you know, I got to do something. And and Frankfurt was suffering. They hadn't won a game. I think they were uh, 0-10 by that time or something like that. They, they just were going on a terrible losing streak and they needed something too. So, um, and I think they had, I think they had more fan interest. Uh, so they were they were doing better financially, I think, uh, possibly. But anyways, um, what happened then was Dunn sold the player contracts. Not all of them. He sold three players uh, contracts to Green Bay, but he sold all the rest uh, to Frankfurt Athletic Association. Um, and so I don't I don't think that it was necessarily a franchise acquisition as much as it was just players. Um, but af- from that point on. The Frankfurt Athletic Association ran the show and they actually – so they played out the Minneapolis Red Jackets schedule and the Minneapolis – or excuse me, the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets schedule, but using players from both teams on on both teams. And so um, there were three guys uh, in the uh, – from the Red Jackets, um, uh, two uh, University of Minnesota players, Herb Josting and George Gibson, and then also a University of Southern California player named Nate Barriger, who went on to be a big Hollywood guy. But anyways, those three guys played in every single Red Jackets and Yellow Jackets game after November 2nd, so nine total games. And um, three of those Red Jacket games were the day after uh, – or the three Red Jackets games were the day after uh, a game with the uh, for the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets because they would play on Saturday because of Blue Laws. So um, so those three those three men played back you know Saturday and then they played Sunday. <laughs> crazy, totally crazy. All right, well let me let's just sort of r- round this out then. So <clears throat> um, it's just very interesting that uh, and kudos for 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 you know getting this story out there because you know one looks at the nfl history just by itself of these one slash two teams right or a total of seven seasons i think there were two three five four six wins across Mm -hmm. the seven seasons yeah um in the nfl yet um predated by just an absolute um dominating uh, run as an independent team prior. Um, so it's an interesting story and it's a dichotomy and, and um, it's great that it's it's officially now sort of in the books, literally and figuratively, courtesy of of uh, of, of you. So I guess the, the, the roundabout question then is, why did it take 30 years after that for the NFL to come back and recognize that Minneapolis-St. Paul uh, and the region of Minnesota was still a very viable football market. Well, actually, they tried. You know, the NFL under at least under Joe Carr did try to come back to Minneapolis. Um, like I said, shortly, you know, within the first handful of years after they um, after John Dunn quit the the Minneapolis Red Jackets. Carr would come back and talk to um, John Dunn and say, hey, you should restart your your franchise. Um, but, you know, what happened was actually in the 1930s was there was a sort of a minor professional league that started up uh, called the Midwest Professional Football League. And uh, there was there was a team uh, curiously called the Minnesota (laughs) All-Stars. There were some former Red Jackets players that played, and and Marines players, uh, and Dean's player, because Bobby Marshall played on this Minnesota All-Stars team uh, in the 1930s, um, which was part of this minor professional league against uh, teams, I think, uh, well, some teams from Wisconsin and Iowa and and places like that. And they, they had a run of, I don't know if it was four or five years, maybe. Uh, And there was actually at one point sort of the, the NFL sort of gave it, it's a nod of approval for this minor league, I guess, as sort of a feeder system. Um, And then um, the, uh, in the early 1950s, after Minneapolis finally built a stadium called parade stadium, um, 
uh, I think it was a 20,000 seat capacity. Uh, there was a there was a string of seasons there in the 1950s where they would have exhibition games, uh, NFL teams. So Green Bay was a frequent one. Uh, I think that you know. One of the things about living up in the Minnesota area, you know, being a Vikings fan is there's a lot of Green Bay Packers fans around and they're not recent Packers fans or they got family history that goes way back. Right. As, as Packers fans. Um, and so the Packers played um, several exhibition games there. Um, and then also I, uh, there, were, there was other teams. I, Steelers come to mind. Um, and so. Anyway, so they played some games there in the 50s. So it wasn't like the NFL was ignoring Minneapolis. I, I just I don't know if it was um, you know there's probably all kinds of reasons right uh, maybe they maybe they maybe after the experience with the Marines and the Red Jackets people were really shy to try to invest in something like that. Yeah, it was also sort of uh, you know the 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 more move westward right was just kind of getting going with you know baseball finally recognizing that there was a West Coast and and all the other pro leagues that sort of followed. All right, here's my last question then. Um, I'm always fascinated by teams that, that don't exist anymore and uh, how much they are or are not remembered. So make the case, if there is one to be made, um, should the Vikings, being the team that's been there for what now 50 some odd years, uh, look back and maybe uh, maybe want to uh, tip their uh, their purple uh Helmets in the general direction of the Marines slash Red Jackets uh, as a bit of a, a nod towards football history. Has there been any outreach? Uh, perhaps is the existence of this book and your research perhaps created an excuse for such? Well, I'm hoping that maybe this book might, you know, create an excuse for some of that, um, you know, more recently, at least, to, um, you know, to help people today understand that this team existed, right? Um, in the past, though, there are some things that I have that I saw in the reports that indicate that the Vikings recognized uh, the former Marines who were still around when the Vikings started. I think it was about 1963, they did like a halftime ceremony and recognized the Marines and Red Jackets players and, 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 and called them Oh, you know, NFL alumni and some of the players themselves later in some things that they said, they called themselves Vikings alumni. So they so it sounds like they were sort of taken in, uh, you know, by <clears throat> by the the owners or maybe the coach or whoever, uh, you know, to 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 welcome them um, as 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 being important in some way. And so it's not like the uh, the Vikings came on the scene and didn't recognize that there were these teams. It did happen, but it had, it had been a number of years, you know, since those teams were in existence. And so even by then, for them to to not make a nod to that those old teams, you know, the. the I mean, the players that they would have been on that halftime ceremony would have been quite old by that time. And so, um, you know, the people in the stands probably didn't care much because they just didn't know much about them. Well, for your sake, I hope uh, it does renew some some interest in some historical, um, uh, you know, tying of knots, so to speak, and and, and maybe uh, kind of loose take those loose ends and kind of bring them together. Uh, and I'm, you know, there's clearly not going to be an old timers game right? for, 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 for <laughs> obvious reasons. But <laughs> um, but it does, uh, you know, I it's interesting, I think, as the league uh, continues to um, dominate the professional sports scene. I mean, I think uh, it's really important to kind of uh, especially those early years. Right. I mean, I I think they're kind of papered over. Right. Like I was like George Hallis and the guys in the room and, and all was great. And, and it was you know, uh, upwards and onwards, 1920 uninterrupted, right? Well, it wasn't, right? <laughs> no. we, had the, we, we had the the war years of World War II and teams kind of collapsing and folding and, and doubling down. And, and there's lots of bumps and, and bruises along the way, literally and figuratively for this league. Um, I think it would be kind of neat. And I think it would be kind of a, 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 a justification, I guess, of history to somehow uh, tie the uh, tie the pieces together so uh, that people in the Minneapolis area would recognize that pro football did not start in 1960 that is the Vikings and the current NFL might like you'd think. Mm -hmm. And I, I have reached out to some folks and I haven't heard back yet, but I should, I should probably send them copies of my book, but they, 
they uh, reached out to some county commissioners, some city councilmen. I tr- I've tried to contact the Vikings. That's hard. But um, the uh, <clears throat> there is – so where the, the Marines – The building where they had their headquarters, where the club met, that building's not there anymore. It's just a vacant lot. And if you stand in that vacant lot, um, you actually look across. You don't see the the highways and stuff that are down a little bit lower, but you can look across over the top of these highways that are there. And clearly, you have a a picture um, from, from that vantage point. U.S. Bank Stadium, <laughs> and you have the Minnesota Vikings um, administrative offices on, on that end of the stadium. So if you want to stand in the spot of history and look northwest, you can see the current team and, and the stadium that's right there. So there's a there's actually this sort of weird, you know, uh, a hair-raising connection uh, in Minneapolis, and it would be cool if there was maybe some kind of historical marker there or something. Well, there you go. Everything you needed to know and then some about the great Fred Chicken. Again, another piece of information I did not know before starting this episode. Uh, Our thanks to RC uh, for uh, this conversation and uh, importantly for this book. It's called Mill City Scrum, the history of Minnesota's first team in the National Football League. It's really two teams, right? It's the Minneapolis Marines and the Minneapolis Red Jackets. It is... um, very well written and it is thoroughly uh, researched and uh, for you completists out there this is a book that you must have especially if you fancy yourself as all knowing in the realm of professional football Uh, your library will be um, lacking without uh, this uh, this tome in uh, your shelves again mill city scrum it is available wherever good books are found of course it's available on places like amazon and we encourage you to purchase said book through our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, just search up this episode number 313 with our guest this week, R.C. Christensen, and uh, you'll be whisked away very easily and quickly with a click of a button uh, to the uh, Amazon website to purchase it. And we will get literally a couple of cents of referral love, and we appreciate that. And uh, you will enjoy the book thoroughly, and you probably can't get it any faster Uh, then through that method. Uh, While you're on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com, please, by all means, uh, take a little sampler uh, around all of our other 300 and some odd episodes that we posted so far and and we'll continue to post up there. Of course, the best way to ensure that you get every single episode is to subscribe or follow us in whatever podcast mechanism that uh, you choose to download or stream through or whatever. Uh, And um, we appreciate you subscribing and following us in that realm uh, as well. Uh, Let's see. You can follow us on social media. Uh, We are on threads. Yes, we're on threads at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, You will find us on Twitter still at Good Seats Still. Uh, You will find us at Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. And you will also find us on Facebook at Good Seats Still Available. You will also find us on the email we're at hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Our thanks to Jerry Payne of Jerry Payne Audio Excellence. Thank you, sir, for your knob twiddling one more time this week. And uh, until next week, we bid you a fond adieu. Thank you for listening. <laughs>